Oh. Oh, oh, the broadcast is live. There we go. Hi, everyone. Give us a comment. Somebody let, let us know where you're from so we can make sure that we're live. I don't see any comments. I hope everybody is doing well. I hope everybody is is getting out. And um, if you can, uh, where you live and enjoying the outdoors and hopefully doing some fishing. Um, I'm not going to introduce myself until we make sure we're live. Ah, okay. Steven from Atlanta is here. So anyway, uh, looks like we're live. Jesse Haller. All right. Tom are Rosenbauer. You, are you nervous, yeah. Jesse? Are you nervous, Jesse Haller? Uh, as you know, I'm very nervous in public speaking, so um, it helps. Yeah, yeah, sure. In, yeah. Bedroom in, the, in my own home, it makes it a little easier on the nerves. Your beard is your beard is looking good since I, I haven't seen you in uh, I haven't seen you in a while. You know, it, I I miss you guys. So. <laughs> we miss you too. Uh, I, I can finally say it took me forty years to grow a beard. I remember my going into my senior year of high school. I'm like, this is the year I'm going to be able to grow a beard, and it took me twenty two more years to do it. Well, it's, it's looking good, Jesse. You well, look thank like, you. You look like a real fish, bro. <laughs> so now I need to shave it. Is what you're saying? <laughs> no, you need to grow it longer. Oh, goodness. I don't think I would be allowed in my house for too much longer. No. No, it's uh, it's it's unpopular. Well, they have these things called beard trimmers that you can, you know, keep it keep it shorter. If, keep it, uh, yes, if, yeah, absolutely. If you want to, if you want to keep it. So I guess people are here. Uh, there's somebody from Patagonia. Nice. And Josh and Josh is here. Josh does. Oh, Patagonia, Argentina, not Patagonia, Arizona, too. Um, and Josh is here, but Josh didn't say where he's from. So we have some people listening. So I guess I'll. I'll make some introductions here. I'm Tom Rosenbauer, and I've worked for Orvis for almost 44 years in various uh, various capacities, just about most of the things that, that could be done there. And um, I am um, grateful to have my, my friend, fishing buddy, uh, fly tying, and especially Euro nymphing guru, okay. The resident, the resident Euro nymphing guru at Orvis, Jesse is the one that we all go to for our answers uh, when we can't, when we can't get hold of George Daniel. <laughs> well, but, yeah, um, when you when you can't talk to the real expert, <laughs> I might be able to, you yeah, are you right. are good enough for me, Jesse. But you know, I, I I just feel so lucky to to work with people like Jesse, and I get to I get to hang out with these cool product developers. Uh, in the office when we're in the office all day long, and um, I really, I really miss you guys because we have such a, we have such a good time. Yeah, <laughs> when absolutely. we're together. So um, we got people from Missoula and Wisconsin. All right, go, go Bucky, go Packers. Hudson Falls, New York, Missouri, California. Uh, Jeff, we don't know where Jeff's from. Orlando. So we got some. Got some international people. So um, we're going to be talking about fly lines today, and um, we will um, we'll take questions for sure. That's that's why we're here live. Um, I'll be kind of feeding questions to Jesse or answering the ones that, that I can, but Jesse's the expert here. Uh, Jesse, why don't you talk, um, first of all, why don't you talk a little bit about, about fly lines, how they're made, um, you know, tapers, cores, just the basics of fly line so that when we start um, using some lingo a little bit later in the show, people will uh, people will understand what, what you're talking about. Sure. So um, I'm Jesse Haller. I'm a product developer um, for Orvis. Um, I do fly lines, um, packs and bags, several different things for Orvis accessories um, and do the design and development of those products. Um, Fly lines is something I've been doing for, I've been with the company for five years. I've been doing fly lines for a few years uh, and it's been a really fun process um, to be involved uh, in the time that I've been here. We've done quite a bit with fly lines. So it's been an exciting time to be in fly line design. Um, so fly lines um, uh, are unlike conventional rods where we would typically throw the weight of the lure 
uh, to actually propel the lure out. Um, a fly rod is basically a giant spring and we get that spring to propel our fly forward by loading the spring with the weight of the fly line. So the fly line, this coated, this coated piece of line um, is how the fly rod flexes and then we deliver the energy from our arm through the rod to the fly line, uh, which eventually delivers the fly, hopefully perfectly um, on target. Um, <clears throat> fly lines um, are basically, the core of a fly line is basically like a, a braided material. Um, in a lot of a lot of fly lines is a, a material called multifilament, which is a lot like Dacron. Um, and then that, and then it's coated over. There's also braided monofilament, similar to fishing line as you and I know it. And there's also single strand monofilament, which is uh, another uh, core um, that can be used. Um, so what we do is we coat over that with a kind of a plasticizer. Um, it's, you know, kind of a, a just a material that'll harden the plastic is one way to kind of look at it. And it goes through a machine in which the fly line core is drawn through the machine and we put the coating on. And as uh, the coating goes on, a diaphragm adjusts to create the thickness on the fly line. And that's how we get a taper, right? Um, so that taper is, you know, we can do all sorts of different thicknesses, which is basically how we can customize a fly line to do a specific thing. Um, a taper. Jesse, why don't we talk, why don't you talk about the, the types of cores uh, for first before we get in taper and um, what, what each type of core would be used for? Sure. So going back to the multi-filament core, um, which is a braided material, think of kind of like a Chinese finger trap it would be a good way to kind of, it's it's sort of hollow. Uh, it would look like a very small, continuous Chinese finger trap. Um, Dacron is a really good, so the backing material that you use after your fly line is a really good example of what that would look like. Um, and that one is, it's a really nice, flexible material. Um, it, uh, does not get overly rigid in cooler water scenarios. So you typically see multi-filament cores on our freshwater fly lines or fly lines that are kind of designed for use in cooler weather conditions, whether it's air temp or especially water temp. Um, braided monofilament, so it's very similar to, to the, the material that I was talking about, multi-filament, but this is a slightly more rigid material. Uh, and the braided monofilament core is a little bit better for those warmer environments. So think uh, warm, warm uh, freshwater species, uh, as well as in saltwater situations, especially tropic saltwater situations. What temperature? Um, what temperatures, Jesse? Would you make the cutoff from you know from where braid is better to where mono <laughs> is better? I would say water temps in 75 degrees, somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees is a is an interesting area. 70, um, you start to see a little bit of a performance change. 75, you're starting to see more, but I'm not gonna tell you that a multi-filament core does not work. Um, like if you were to go, you know, uh, fishing with a, for carp fishing in a warm, uh, on a warm day in July and you're using a multi-filament core, it's not gonna not work for you. It's just gonna be a little gummier. Um, so 70, 75 is probably a good place to kind of think about that temperature change in the water temperature. Between the two cores, I guess, would be a, a, would some way to kind of, some number to kind of focus on. Does that make Great. sense? Yeah. Great, yeah. yeah. Um, so core wise, and then uh, a lot of times you see single strand as well, which is going to be just like you pulled off a piece of 20 pound, 25 pound, 35 pound or whatever. And then they'll quote over that. You see that a lot in sinking lines um, specifically um, where it, you will put like a, an intermediate might be built on a single core, a uh, single strand core or, um, you know, like our depth charge is another example. Okay. All right. Now you can go on to tapers. <laughs> okay. So, um, so a taper is basically um, is the where the thickness of the fly line really is. Um, if you think about parts of a fly line, uh, you have your part that goes onto the reel first, and that's called your running line. That's usually just a single diameter, relatively thin. You're not getting a lot of performance out of that section. It's filling up the reel to some extent in floating line. It still floats, so you can cast past your head of your fly line out. And then as you kind of start going up, you're going to have your rear taper. Um, from the running line, which is going to basically be kind of that angle change from the thinness of the running line up into 
Let's see, I got, so I got, can you see this? So here's our running line right here. And then you're going to see the rear taper here that the, it kind of just, goes up into the side of that first belly on this particular line. And then all the way at the front, you have your front taper. So if you think about a fly line, it kind of comes up, stays level, which is the belly. And then the front taper kind of comes down to where the tip of the fly line is or where the, um, the actual leader will end up going. Um, and the thickness of the material, the length of the taper, the abruptness of the angle of the taper or the shallowness of that angle care all different things that can be tweaked to get a fly line to do different things, right? So if we want a fly line to del lay delicately uh, on the water, we may extend that front taper a fair or fair ways. Um, that would allow the energy to slowly transfer out of the fly line. If we wanted it to really drive over and turn a popper over, um, that's a wind resistant fly, it would have kind of a steep taper in the front and that would just drive it and kind of slap it over. So when you look at a fly line, which is really interesting, as you kind of pass it through your fingers, you might be able to notice where it starts to get thinner and thicker, um, you know, as you run it through. But it's actually relatively minute when you think about it. We're talking of thousands of an inch in, in some situations. So it's really impressive that how much those subtle changes can actually make, um, can actually change how the fly line performs. Does that... Does that did I get a little too technical, or was that a, a decent kind of intro? No, I think that's great. I think okay. that's great. So now let's talk about you know one of the one of the confusing parts of fly line is particularly in floating lines is there are so many different floating lines available. Oh, before we do that, should we talk about the various? Um, uh, Price points of fly lines that we have, just so people know what they're what they're getting for sure. for each price point. Well, so in general, um, there's there's many different aspects of um, what you can do to fly lines to enhance them, um, to make them better, and so on and so forth. Um, one thing would be uh, just the overall um, the design would be one. The components and and then. Uh, you know, basically the quality of the components. And another one that we talk a lot about is kind of slickness and its ability to kind of like shed dirt, um, whether it's textured or not. Um, all of these things kind of play into the different levels of performance out of a fly line. Um, so with, with Orbis, we have that great good, better, best story. And Clearwater is our great kind of like, it's a really good fly line. It's a, it's a good value fly line. Um, the Clearwater family, we have a basic floating line, and a suite of a couple different sinking rate lines. Uh, and then we have our newly launched Hydros line, which um, has a really nice um, slickness additive that used to be our premium additive. It's called AST, um, which it's very similar to the IS um, integrated slickness that we used to use. Um, and then we have this new material, this new slickness agent, which is an additive um, called AST Plus um, that we're using in our Pro Series fly lines. The Pro Series fly lines has um some really cool design elements there are three colored lines um they have compound um tapers in them which are um where the angles change a little bit more kind of similar to the line i was showing you um here where it's not just a one up and a flat and a down um front taper belly rear taper but multiple different kind of um uh, first belly second belly two two rear tapers kind of a uh, a lot going on with the design of our pro fly lines that have really tuned the fly lines to be the best performing lines that we possibly have. So that's that's one thing of the pro and the pro design that we kind of get as you go up the thing. The Hydros lines have been our, our new launch for us. Uh, there's a bunch of new tapers in there um, that are pretty exciting. And, uh, and the Clearwater was recently redone as well. So, um, we're really excited with the, pr the launch of all three series of fly lines in the last two years that we have a lot going on, um, as far as new and exciting with Orvis, um, and technology wise. So we have a couple questions, um, uh, about double tapers. First of all, Jeff says, bring back true double taper sign roll casters everywhere. And then Reagan asked, do you ever use a double taper line? And if so, in what situation? So would you like to handle those two kind of the, uh, uh, request and, uh, and a question? 
Well, sure. Um, so in our hydros family, we have we have a double taper line, um, our double taper trout, um, and there's the, the double taper is for people to understand. Um, as I described before, um, we have a kind of a front head and then the running line of the kind of the 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 fly lines that we've been talking about. With a double taper, you're basically getting the same front taper and performance out of the line on both sides. Uh, one of those advantages um, and having that really basically a long, long, long belly, which gives you a lot more power. And talking about the, the roll cast, for example, you have that a lot of power sitting much further back in the line. So you can roll cast a quite a bit of distance with a double taper line. To some people who fish smaller crease and don't cast a lot of line, uh, or get a lot of distance, it's nice because they can take that line and flip it over and get use out of the other back end because it's the same as the front end. They're basically, there is no back end, it's two front ends. Um, double tapers are useful, um, without a doubt. Um, I think you get a lot of performance um, out of some of the new style compound tapers um, that people have gravitated towards the better loop stability we can get out of a dual belly line um, and just just performance metrics in general, but there is absolutely still a place for it. We still, do, we do have our, our double taper trout line and our hydros line, um, but there's always an opportunity to continue to look at growing the double taper opportunity, uh, the double tapers in our assortment as well. So does that answer both of them or did I, did I miss one? No, that that's, that's good. And I think one of the things that people should understand is that, uh, for the first 35 feet or so, wait forward and double taper if their standard lines are exactly the same taper. Mm -hmm. And then wait forward, thin down so that you can shoot line easier because there's less mass and you yep. can carry that line through the air. Whereas if you're making a long roll cast, a double taper has more mass further out there so that you can make that long, long roll cast. Absolutely. Yeah. It's if you, I mean, if you look at um, some of our, our new uh, pro trout lines, our pro trout and our power taper, they now have 50 foot heads. And one of the reasons why we designed the heads to be 50 feet is um, it allows you great line control at a further distance as well. Um, so if you figure you're, you know, if on the Missouri or on the West Branch of the Delaware, you're making long casts to rising fish. Once you send out, if you put out a 40 foot head and you still need to mend to that, once you get past the end of, excuse me, get past the end of the head, it's very hard to use that running line to stack mend. So by adding an additional 10 feet to the overall head in the rear taper, basically, it gives you additional line control. The added benefit of that is you have a 10 more feet that could be used for roll cast as well. Um, and gives you a little bit more control on that, basically that second belly and that rear taper on those longer heads. Now, is it a perfect substitute for a double taper for, no, not necessarily. Um, and traditionally, um, you know, that the double taper is, as you kind of said, is for people doing this long roll cast or in some situations, people using it for shorter, um, you know, short, smaller, smaller watersheds, but they don't actually have to cast out that much. But having that extended amount of mass, like you said, you basically don't run out of mass, which is kind of cool. Um, Jim is asking, what do you think of floating line used with a weighted leader? Pros and cons. Um, absolutely. I think uh, I actually saw an article that uh, Orvis reposted uh, talking about using a poly leader um, on top of floating line. I, I mean, we talk about being as absolutely prepared for any situation as you can. You know, do you carry two rods? Do you carry a second reel with a sink tip on it? So you're, you know, you're fishing, you know, whatever situation and you want to fish a streamer, um, a pot leader is a really good solution to that, right? Um, and to be able to get that extra kind of weight to get your your streamer down a little bit further, swing your nymphs or, or whatever. Um, we've talked a lot about in the recent past about why we actually make triple density lines where we're having dense the fly lines sink at three different rates all in the course of the line because it allows your line to become more sink more gradually. Um, and you have better connectivity to your fly. With a floating line and a poly leader, you're gonna have a little bit of a hinge right there. So when you set the hook on something, you kind of got to make up this distance before you're really connecting to the fish. So this is negligible in some situations, right? But it, it adds a little bit of hinge. But I still carry to this to this day, I always carry a poly leader 
just in case that kind of situation comes up. I personally like to fish streamers um, with light flies and not put a lot of weight on the fly. Let the let the, the weight of the, the either sink tip or full sink line or poly leader help get the fly down a little bit more and plane the fly rather than kind of jigging it and it's stripped. So um, I, I'm totally pro poly leader and a sinking line um, on, a, on a thing. It's not the perfect solution if you're only going to streamer fish, but it's a really good uh, leg up if you're only if you're only carrying a floating line. Yeah, I don't. I don't do yeah, what, what's your? I thing? don't carry. I don't carry sink tips anymore. I don't have it. I don't. I don't think I own a sink tip. Um, I use a poly leader with my floating line, and I always have one, like mm -hmm. you said, just in case I need to fish a streamer deep. And if I'm seriously fishing streamers and it's deep and fast, I'll probably go to a depth charge line which a lot of people right. consider uh, a saltwater line, but it's a great streamer line if you if you got really fast, heavy water. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a, that's a great question. Um, and yeah. I think they're really useful tools. I mean, yeah, talk about things you should definitely have in your vest. I think that's our pack or boat bag or whatever. I think that's one of them. <laughs> I still have a vest. vest. <laughs> Jesse still wears a vest. Actually, I have it <laughs> recently. You okay. have it? No. You've been wearing a sling bag? No. What have you been wearing? I can't tell you because it's top secret still. Oh, you saw a product you're testing? <laughs> yes. Oh, I want to know. Yeah. I want to know what you're using. Uh, so we're getting some we're getting some uh tippet questions. What's the difference between nylon and fluorocarbon? How to decide which one to use? Um Obviously, they're two different materials. Um, I prefer fluorocarbon in a lot of situations. And everybody talks about how fluorocarbon is invisible, right? Um, I'm going to leave that one completely out that and let that. I can't talk to a fish, so I don't know if he didn't see my line before he ate my fly. But I'm just speculating. Let's just throw that one out for a second. The thing about fluorocarbon is it's denser material. So it's highly abrasion resistant. So it, uh, if you're fishing subsurface um, uh, with it, it's going to be basically take more dings, right? It's going to be able to take more dings, take more abrasion on it. Also, because of its density, it makes it sink a little bit faster. So it's just another thing to add. If you're talking about European nymphine, for example, or streamer fishing, um, you're going to have a material that um, gives you, just helps you out sinking a little bit faster. Um, not, however, to the the contrary of that. It doesn't always make the best uh, dry fly material, partly for that reason, right? Um, it does have a density. So if it's able to break the surface film, it's going to want to sink a little bit faster. Some people do like it because it gets it off the top and maybe lets it sit in the film a little bit. Um, but I typically use nylon for any dry fly work um, and fluorocarbon for any um, subsurface work. Tom, this is another one I think I, I'm interested in your opinion on that. I think that's a you could take a stance on any of them, right? Yeah, I agree with everything you said. The invisibility, I think, is crap. I mean, I think fish can always see different. They can sure. see eight. They can see eight x fluorocarbon if they if they want to. Right. Um, but um, but you know the other considerations of fluorocarbon are that um, it never breaks down, so you have to be really careful of disposing it. Nylon will eventually degrade. Fluorocarbon will not. The advantage there is you can have 10 year old fluorocarbon and it's still going to be good. You don't mm -hmm. have to, you know, like I replace my nylon every year, you know, from 2X down because I don't trust it. Fluorocarbon, I got, you know, I'm using tw some old 20 year old fluorocarbon. Sure. Um, fluorocarbon is what, three times the price of nylon? So it's, yep, it's an that's expensive fair. material and it is a little harder to not. Yeah. Um, we join it to we join it to nylon a lot because uh, I know Jesse and I both use nylon leaders and then we put fluorocarbon tippet on when we're nymph fishing. And so you have to be really careful of your knots, a triple surgeons or a five turn blood knot, or use a tippet ring, which removes the problem of the two materials mating together. So right. a tippet ring is really good idea for using a nylon leader with a fluorocarbon tippet. Yeah. Um, but it is harder to not, and um, you know, yeah. nylon's a little more supple and uh, easier to not. Um, 
If you didn't have to make, this is a good one, if you didn't have to make a competition legal, would you have designed the Hydro's tactical nymph line differently? No. So, I, you know, it's, that's a great question. I love this question. Um, I actually took a lot of flack for the Hydro's tactical nymph line, and here's why. Because everybody wanted a, a totally level, flat, 22,000s, just <laughs> coated line. Um, and the Hydro's tactical nymph was designed specifically to not be that it is actually a true double taper um it is a very very thin double taper that starts at about 0.028 and goes up to 0.038 um and again we're talking thousands of an inch here which is negligible to the kind of the naked eye but it actually has a difference and the the reason why i did that is because i wanted that line oh, that front taper is really fairly long um you're not getting a ton of additional sag out of 16 thousandths of an inch, you know, which is part of the reason why people go to mono rigs. And, and I, and I totally understand and get the, the logic behind going to a mono rig um, or wanting a level line, but the hydrostatical nymph was designed. So it did have just a subtle element of the ability to be able to cast a leader. Um, that was inspired by, you know, being out nymphing, working through pocket water stretches, coming up to a flat and then having fish up. And I just decided that if I'm nymphing along and I come along fish that are eating off the surface um, and not competitive fishing, um, fun fishing, which I do more of that than competitive fishing these days, um, the that I was gonna throw dry flies at these fish. So by building this really thin, subtle double taper, it allows you to put a normal leader on it and with a European nymph rod, a two weight or a three weight, be able to cast a dry fly with that line. There's just enough mass there to be able to use the Euro rod and actually be able to make cast this 25 feet long, which was a big part of that design. It was a it was a kind of a delicate balance between not having having too much mass where it would absolutely kind of give you sag, um, but having enough to be able to propel a standard tapered leader. On the flip side of that, one of the cool things about the new Pro Trout line is it has a 22 foot three, three section front taper that really is very slowly and progressive. And it also makes a really good Euro Nymph line as long as you don't go past that front taper, um, which you wouldn't have thought so, but it's actually that, almost does the job better because it's a more versatile line if I was to put a new leader on that one versus a Euro leader. Um, the Hydro's Tactical Nymph, I, I use that line regularly and I think it's really good. So personally, I wouldn't have changed it. Now there's people who say monofilament core, um, no loops. Um, there's a lot of different ways. There's so many different preferences in the world of European nymphing fly line. Um, I chose to make something a little bit more unique to the market. And I think um, we've had some really good feedback from it. Now, will it have a cousin soon that does something a little bit more like some of the other things I was talking about? Probably. Um, but right now, um, that's our European nymphing style tactical nymph line and pretty proud of that line. So. Gary asks, is, is fluorocarbon more you re resistant? Yes, Gary. The answer is yes. And it will last more years on a spool. It will last forever on a spool as far as we know. It yeah. does not break down with UV. And then Robert, here's a here's an interesting question. My nylon recently went through the washing machine. Is it still good? So Robert. I guess, it, Robert, it would depend on whether it was a cold water wash or hot water wash. Probably the heat would probably damage it, and then it, and then the uh, you know the, the detergent, you know the detergent could break it down. I mean. Honestly, it, nylon is a uh, nylon's cheap. I would replace it because you don't want to take a chance and and you know lose the the best fish of your life because your your tip of material went through the washing machine. But it, one thing that'd be really interesting about that is a lot of times you can feel the degradation mm, on nylon yeah. tip. So yeah. you can dry it completely first, and you should be able to run your hands along. And if you feel those little bumps in there, you're it's no good but like you said it's relatively inexpensive so it, it you know could be replaced you know if you're just replacing a few spools you know 10 15 bucks but it would be a really interesting experiment to like let that dry completely pull it out and you sometimes you can see it if you hold it up to the light it's not fully translucent you can see like little areas where it's kind of getting discolored uh but you can also usually feel it 
Like I've had them where I like accidentally left a tippet spool on my dash on my old dashboard. It was like tilted up and a spool just sat there and I was like, I don't know, is it still good? And I pulled it out. It was just like, you know, you could just feel all of the like abrasion from just like getting baked in the sun on um, probably like 200 degrees on a black background, you know, sitting out in some Western um, parking lot on stream access. So, um, yeah. That's a, you, can try, you can try it. I wouldn't trust it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brian wants a 25 foot tapered Euro nymph leader. I like it. Think? I think that's great. I mean, so there's two kind of ways to go about the Euro nymph leaders, right? You make them longer. So the not, uh, the fly line and not never go through the tip top or make them shorter. So they never come back in. Um, our current uh, Euro, uh, European tactical nymph leader is, you know, I think 12 feet. It's, it's great. Um, uh, but you know, that, that does that not that perfection loop does travel through the tip top. And if it's not kind of like cinched down really well, it can cause a little bit of frustration. Um, the other, the other uh, option is there um, is to simply go super long with your leader, like uh, Brian was suggesting, like twenty five foot. That makes total sense. Here's a good question: Can Jesse describe the decision to go with the chartreuse orange white tricolor cider? I see some other options that are black, red, yellow. Sure. Um, well, first of all, was the the decision was like trying to it was thinking about light, right? And black is actually a really good one for glare. And we don't have a solution for that currently, right? Glare, if you imagine glare just comes up white, right? It's like uh, why they put some parachute atoms, they make them with black posts versus white posts. You know, the black kind of sticks out a little bit more. Um, the black uh, is not currently in our um, tactical cider. The reasons why we chose the colors that we did, one, white, for some reason, I've always really liked white. So I really wanted to make sure that white was in there. Um, uh, the other color, chartreuse, showed up better in certain si situations for most people as we were testing. And then orange has kind of been like that constantly used color. But we really did test in a lot of different light scenarios and water types, too. You figure you got a clear, clear river, glacial till river, um, you know, kind of that aqua color. You've got the tannic colored waters. Um, you've got light angles. They all play in. And we wanted to make sure with the tricolor cider that we had something for most scenarios. And I think um, the one place that we might have a little bit of a challenge is maybe in the, the highly glared um, situ scenarios. Um, maybe it should, we should do a four color one uh, and shorten the bars. Um, but really, I've always found like in any scenario, I can get one of those colors. And then once I get one of them, the other ones kind of pop out with it. But like, I might be like, oh, there's the chartreuse. And then I'll see the orange and the white. I actually run on my cider. I run a pretty long cider. I run four, four sections of color, which is um, different than a lot of people. Some people run them a little bit shorter, but I go white, or white, green, orange, white. Um, and I like white at top and down low, because sometimes I will sink my cider and for some reason, I believe the white is less obtrusive to fish. I, you know, that's probably more of me believe that than uh, actual truth. Brian says that chartreuse shows up through amber uh, lens sunglasses as well, too. So that, that's nice, important Brian. because that's, we're, usually, yeah. we're usually wearing amber polarized yeah. glasses. So that's great. Um, Eric says, Something about the detergent. What about making a slinky cider? Yeah, I guess you could make a slinky cider out of that. There you go. Out of that mono that went through the washing machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it did the detergent. If it's tied, yeah. If it's you know seventh generation, you know whatever <laughs> that you still smell after it comes out of the thing, maybe it's not so bad. You could probably you could use it for ribbing nymphs too. There you go. Yeah, I use absolutely. The Anita Colton. Hi, Anita. Says, Hi, Anita. Is the tactical cider material available in different sizes, 2X, 3X, 4X? Coming soon. Coming soon, Anita. Yep. Hang on, Anita. Uh, Benjamin asks, how much tippet do you attach to the seven-foot poly leader when fishing streamers? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. that the, He had asked that question before, and it, it got scrolled by. So how much tip it when you're using the seven foot poly leader when you're fishing a streamer, Jesse? Well, how deep, you know, what kind of fly are you using? I'd also point out another amazing place to use a tippet ring is at the end of a poly leader. Um, 
where people sometimes will tie a fly on or they'll add tippet material to it and then slowly start eating away. You add a little, add a tippet ring to the end of that as soon as you get it. That thing's gonna last a lot longer. Um, for me, 36 inches at most, probably. Not not a horrible amount. Um, it really depends on the water type I'm fishing. And am I actively stripping um, to kind of pull pulling flies back towards me? Am I casting out and swinging? Um, in which it doesn't, I don't need to have a ton of length. Um, is there a lot of weight on the fly? So on and so forth. But yeah, 30, 36 inches, my personal preference. I would, I would punt right back to you, Tom, if that sounds, uh, how you feel about that. I usually go, I usually go around four feet, but I may be, I may be fishing one that's too long. No, not necessarily. I may be fishing one that's too short. Well, you know, I, I got to figure out a couple fly break offs and changes. So I'm lazy. So maybe that's why I start with four feet. <laughs> sure. Um, Jimmy has a good question here. Do you focus on one color of the cider when you're watching it or do you try to watch the whole item? And I see the comment about amber lenses, which I also use. Is that what you recommend for polarized lenses or is there another color that's better for a wooded trout stream? Well, I can answer the second part. Amber is probably the best for all around fishing. I not found a better color. I agree wholeheartedly. The only yeah. thing that I would say is I have really found a lot of use out of um, low light as well for like, this is like the every once in a while, but certainly as we get into this time of the year where Hendrickson spinner falls and things like that start coming um, and gray days as well. Uh, something that's a very low light, uh, low tint to it, but still polarizes and takes away the glare, especially for like Hendrickson spinner falls or something of that nature where I can take away a little bit of the glare and I can see a little bit better, but Amber for me personally, all day long. Um, do I focus on the whole cider? That's a good question. I don't think I've ever really thought about that, whether I'm actually focusing on the whole thing. Um, yeah, I guess I kind of am focusing. I mean, I'm certainly not focusing on anything above it. Um, probably focusing on the bottom, you know, half of it, you know, at most. Uh, a lot of times I'm looking down where my tippet ring is for some reason, kind of watching the connection and then really paying attention to like the end of the cider and basically the pace of the water to make sure that I'm not moving too fast. I think that's, I, I, that's more where I'm looking. So the very bottom of the cider, is probably where my eyes are most of the time. Uh, Jamie asks, would it be practical to retie tippet onto a used poly leader with a nail knot? Maybe seems wasteful to discard it if the tippet part has been used up. I can answer that one because it happens to me. Yeah, you should. You you do, absolutely shouldn't th uh, get a new poly leader if that tippet part is used up. Um, a nail knot sometimes doesn't work that well yeah, on that thing. material. So what I do, Jamie, is I double the end of that poly leader around. So I make a loop in the end, just double it over. And then I take like 12 pound test or 15 pound test monofilament. And I do two little nail knots on top of that, or even three, if you want to. And then um, that's, that's how we used to secure the back end of, um, of uh, saltwater lines before we had, before we had those good permanent loops. So just take two little nail knots. You could do a speed nail knot uh, with monofilament and then, you know, trim off the little tag end of poly leader. And then you got a permanent loop on the end of your poly leader. Then you mm -hmm. can just loop, loop your tippet on there. Yeah, I same thing. Uh, I've done the nail knot, and you just strip the coating off. Yeah, and then come off. Back and yeah. So if you, double it, if, you double it, if you double it over, then you're uh, then you're in good shape. If you want to get really geeky, um, what I also do is I I put a bimini twist and make a doubled loop at the end of my tippet. I tie up a bunch of bimini twists at the beginning of the season in two x and one x for streamers. I found that that uh, connection is really, really strong. I've broken a lot of perfection loops and surgeons loops uh, in my tippet when using those things. Not well, usually there's, fish, there's your usually great in nags. <laughs> there's your great quarantine activity is learn how to tie a bimini. Yeah, that's, yeah. You learn, don't how to, know. learn how to tie a bimini twist and, and make up a bunch of, you know, three or four foot tippets and two X or one X for, and then just roll them up and put them, put them in a baggie and, Put them in your uh, fishing vest or per <laughs> or purse. Somebody said you were using a purse. I that's I, I was. It's a it's a um, it's a satchel. 
a satchel. <laughs> yeah, sure it is, Jesse. <laughs> uh let's see oh scott um is asking could you use a permanent marker to shade a piece black if uh on your cider if glare comes into play on sure it? Would, absolutely would it, would it hold would it hold up um for a while right? Right, eventually i mean honestly it's nylon material so it's relatively porous so huh. i mean if you hit it with a sharpie my guess is if you let it sit there for a little while it'll probably sink in i mean it might get a little dull but I'm yeah. sure anybody who fished a cider for a while, you notice that it kind of UV, they get UV'd out. Usually I have to replace my cider, you know, depending on what leader I'm fishing. If I'm fishing one for a fair amount, I got to replace my cider every couple months anyways. So it's still really vibrant. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You could absolutely hit it with a Sharpie. I'm not, I don't want to say that I'm guaranteeing it, but I, it will work. Um, it, yeah. How long it lasts is, a, is the question. Yeah. So but good idea. Good. Good fix. Yeah. I, know, like, I used to, when I first started European pretty different, I actually used a cider that was made out of Dacron. Um, and you could bar it with a, with a, um, mm -hmm. with a permanent marker. And it worked great because you could, the barring in general really did stick out. Uh, and you could bar your piece of cider right now. Um, and that, that would all work. Absolutely. I think that's a, a really good idea. Yeah. Great idea. Or an Australian played knot, I guess. Mark is referring to the bimini. I don't know an Australian played knot, but I'm, yeah, okay. <laughs> Australian played knot. Uh, that's one I'll have to learn while I'm sitting there. Around. We go. We've got, we've got a homework assignment now. Yeah, yeah. Australian played knot. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I just, one other thing, I just want to talk a little bit about really quick with the fly lines, unless you have any more questions. Not right now. Nope. Go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of just trout lines in general, since it's a very trouty time of the year. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's kind of going on um, with our trout fly line assortment um, with our float. Let's we'll start with floating just for, to keep it easy. Um, uh, obviously we have um, our clear water line, which is really a super versatile line. It's not, it's, it's, it's sort of trout specific. It's, it's a half size heavy and we won't get into uh, a lot of information about, but basically there are weights of these fly lines that they're physical weight and uh, the, it's measured by the first 30 feet of the head. And um, within each slot, a five weight line should be this amount of weight and this. Are. So a lot of manufacturers, will break that kind of um, that mold and actually make them maybe a little bit heavier. Um, and that'll load the rod a little bit easier. Our clear water line is a little bit heavier just to load the rod a little bit easier, right? Um, and our hydros trout line, um, that's a standard, you know, right on, it's a number five weight um, or six weight or seven weight. And it's a pretty solid traditional style taper, you know, front taper, Rear, uh, belly rear taper, but it's it's been tuned to really perform well in a myriad of different conditions on all different kinds of rods. Um, and it's actually to have, it's a very, that traditional style, it's it's not broken. It works really, really well. And it's a, it's a great fly line in general, and it's a true to line weight fly line. But when you step up into our pro lines and our pro trout lines are really exciting, not just the pro trout taper, but also what I'm considering the power taper. Um, the power taper uh, is kind of an unsung hero. Um, the new pro power taper is actually different from the original power taper that we had in our um, line in our Hydros HD a few years ago. It's a completely redesigned um, taper, but it just carried the name carried over. Um, and it was actually the taper that I just was showing earlier. I'm just gonna set it up there really quick. Um, this fly line, I really, really, really like. Um, it's a half size heavy as well. So it's 150 grains in, in a five weight. Um, it's got that dual belly and it's got a little bit shorter front taper um, that allows it to be a powerful line. This is a great um, line for uh, people who are nymphing, bigger river systems. It's also got that 50 foot head. So it's got that ability to manipulate the line and line control at a further distance, which is really nice. And it roll casts really well, I might say. And that second belly really keeps really nice loop stability. So when you're throwing an, uh, an indicator rig or a big hopper dropper rig, um, it allows that loop to stay nice and tight, cut through the wind and deliver, uh, deliver the flies. 
the power taper is a super, super cool fly line. Uh, opposite of that is the pro trout line. And that one's a great general purpose line, but it has a lot more of a presentation element to it with that super long front taper. So if you want a line that kind of does everything, pro trout will do that and power taper will do that. But the power taper is better for a little bit more power, pushing it out there in those, um, you know, adverse conditions, um, heavy nymph rigs, hopper dropper, some floating streamer action. And the trout does the middle, but it also gives you really nice, um, delicate presentation as well. So they're just two kind of, two trout lines that do kind of similar, but also kind of separate things. Um, and they're both really, really cool. They're both offered in smooth and they're both offered in textured. And we didn't really talk about textured fly lines either um, in general. So I'm just going to hit that super fast, Tom, and I'll let it go after that. Um, so the texturing, we use a dual texture uh, on our textured fly lines. One texture is relatively aggressive, and that's for shooting, essentially. So it's minimizing friction through the guides, uh, and that's going to allow the line to have less friction taking away from its distance. The other one, um, the other one, sorry, I got them, I got them mixed up. I'm going to eat my own words here. Uh, the, the less aggressive is our shooting one, and that's going to go through the guides. It's not going to be overly abrasive, but it's going to allow the fly line to shoot. The tip, uh, the tip portion of the line that has the aggressive texturing on it, that allows it to be picked up really easily, as well as it helps it float a little bit more because it traps little tiny air bubbles. Um, People have different preferences in textured fly lines. Some people like them. Some people don't like them. Some people don't care. Some people think they're noisy. Um, other people don't mind. Um, it's really personal preference. Are there performance metrics that are make a textured line better? Yes. But is it so wildly better that it's absolutely mandatory? That's for the person to decide. I know people who are very textured loyalists. And I know some people who are only people who fish smooth, smooth fly lines. So luckily in our pro series, we have both textured and smooth uh, in almost every taper that we do. So that's kind of a cool thing. All right, Jesse, come up for air for a minute. We got a, we got, we got a couple of questions I don't want to miss. Um, okay. Philip wants to talk about the Clearwater Intermediate Sink Line. Uh, and yep. He's asking, did, a five-weight line for a five-weight recon rod? Yes. Yeah, and that's a good, you know, Tim Johnson was asking, uh, hi, Tim, was asking about overlining. Um, you know, some people, some people, feel more comfortable overlining or going one line size heavier on their rod makes the rod flex a little bit more. Um, and part of the problem is that uh, a lot of rod manufacturers today are making very stiff rods. The rods are actually underlined. So you, you take a, you take a six weight rod and you call it a five and it feels real stiff and powerful, but it's actually really a, a six weight rod. Um, or our, our design philosophy at Orvis isn't the same. We we design our five weights for a five weight line. Yeah, you could put a six on it. It's going to flex a little bit more. I wouldn't put a four on it. Um, but some rods are, are quite stiff and, and you do need to sometimes overline them. Right. And but, we've also worked now, too, for those people who are the grain weight people, is right underneath there on the bottom, you can see the 150 grains. Um, and that gives you an idea. We kind of took a new stance that we're not going to build lines that are multiple size heavy. The most that we do it in our saltwater line and our igniter, we get a full line size heavy. Um, but pretty much everything else is no more than a half size heavy. Most things are true to grain weight. So yeah, why, why, why do that? Right. Exactly. Because I mean, it's, it's a chicken and the egg kind of cycle. And this yeah, is yeah. That we've discussed a fair amount is, you know, the, the rods get stiffer. So the lines get heavier and we advertise a five weight. That's actually a seven weight line. Yeah. yeah. And then we build an even stiffer rod to do that. And it just keeps going further and further. We're always taking a stance with their fly lines or at their, and their fly rods that matters. Like they want the five to perform like this. Like a five. Um, so we like need a to five, make sure. Exactly. And one of the cool things about the pro fly lines in general was that when we were designing them, we built them to be these awesome, like super general work well for all rods out there. But then we took them back to the lab and kind of tweaked them a little bit more around the H3. Um, so that's a really exciting thing. If you've, if you've casted the H3 when they first came out and then casted the H3 with a pro fly line after the pro fly lines came out a year later, it's, it's really incredible how much we were able to tune those lines 
to perform excellently out of the H3 is, as well. So um, it's it, just another little thing where you can kind of tweak the dials and the tapers just a little bit more and get just a little bit more performance out of them. Um, Ted wants to know, so he's going to the flats and bayous. Uh, which li wine lines would be good for redfish in the shallows, eight and nine weight? Which rod would you, which line would you use for redfish in the shallows? Redfish in the shallows. Uh, I would probably, again, it would be like, what's the water temperature, you know, going to be like? Um, if it's going to be relatively cool, I would do saltwater all rounder. Um, if it was going to be, or the new hydro saltwater, which is a really cool taper as well. Um, if it's going to be relatively warm, um, I would either use an igniter uh, if we were put, if you were pushing big bugs, um, breezy, breezy down there on the bayou, um, and uh, and if not, then I would you know consider the saltwater tropic with the monofilament core so it didn't get a little gummy on you. Uh, let's see. But I want to go fish reds in the shallows down on the bayou. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, you ever used a wax cider? I never heard of a wax cider. I have not, no. Okay. So, Jimmy, no. Jesse's never used a wax cider. Unless you're talking about actually treating your cider material with floating and then floating your cider. I've done that. Oh, maybe. Maybe, uh, maybe you yeah, want to clarify. Kind of or liter or something like that. Yeah. Oh. Here's a good one from my friend Roger Bird. Roger is always here, Jesse. Hi, Roger. Hi, Roger. Jim does texture do texture fly lines affect aerodynamics? That's a really good question. That's a super good question. And I am not the person to be able to tell you if it is or not. I mean, if you figure, I, I would not think that it would overly affect aerodynamics to some extent. I'm, you know, not an aerospace person by any means. Um, but the texturing being what it is, I mean, it's a subtle difference. It's a embossing on the surface. Could it in some ways potentially affect aerodynamics? Minutely at most, um, but possibly. But I think positively, like, right? It's like the dimples in a golf ball. Sure, right? As well. Yeah. So, I mean, it's yeah. it, it, aerodynamics. Put, yeah, I, I, I do know. That's an awesome question. That, that's, a, that's one to, to investigate more uh for sure but they also float marginally better because yeah. they have more surface area and they hold right. more air you can um, get like and you can get tiny little air bubbles to get caught in those like little textured you know areas of also just give a, a little increased buoyancy as well yep scott owen says i heard the difference between a five and six weight in the first 30 feet is the weight of a business card can you confirm let's see <laughs> grains to grams, uh, not knowing the conversion at the top of my head. I'm going to say that's, I don't know how much does a business card weigh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. I, it's probably not that much. I'm a, a couple business cards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Inter it's an interesting way of looking at it though. I like, I'm, I'm like on my computer and I really want to go do the conversion. <laughs> um, how many grams it is. Um, but 10 grains is not much. So, I mean, that's a, probably a relatively accurate statement. Uh, Relative. Here's, here's a good one from Richard. Are fly lines reinforced at the casting sweet spot where I'd imagine the line gets the most friction? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, I think we focus on uh, a coating in general that is going to be able to stand up to anything. Probably one of the most banged up areas of a fly line is wherever the end of your casting distance is the next 10 feet where it's always at your feet and or you're standing on the bank or it's in the boat always on your thing so i don't think that you know we try to build our entire fly line to be super durable um from the welded loop all the way down it's a good question but i wouldn't the, the area i've always seen the most wear on my personal fly lines are just right at the end of my casting distance, the next working line position, because I'm always standing on it or getting it caught on something or like, you know, it's only only so often am I actually standing in the middle of the stream where the fly line can kind of float down. Um, you know, it's Vermont, I'm typically on medium sized water where I'm standing on one bank, so. Henry Cowan, I'm not ignoring you, pal. Jesse, 
You should consider adding a nylon finger guard with your textured lines. I find these lines kill the creases in between my stripping fingers. Henry, I, I, Henry, Henry, I'll send you. I'll send you a finger. Guard. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see. Uh, good to hear from you, Henry. I watched your Facebook live not too long ago as well. <laughs> Uh, Charles wants to know what line in five weight floating would you recommend for warm water juvenile tarpon? Mm. Ooh, um, Tom, I'm gonna let this one. You're the you're the tarpon master. Well, it's a five weight. What which which five weight would hold up best in warmer water? Because we don't have a salt water. I think we got a salt water. We have a salt water tropic six. So Six. Over, overload your five with the salt water. Yeah, it probably wouldn't hurt to overload your five, Charles. Yeah, that's I mean, in that scenario, that sounds like a lot yeah. of fun, though. Yeah, it does with a yeah. five weight. Um, Eric asked, do you see rods being designed with grain weight windows? Well, actually, they are. Rods are designed for a fly line, and a fly line has grain weight windows. So, um, you know, if you look up the AFTMA standards, you'll see that there's a grain weight window there, and that's what the grain weight is on a five weight. Yeah, it's like uh, we find it. You know, we find it as consumers. I think a lot easier to talk to talk numbers, a number system, one to one to twelve or one to fourteen, than talking about grains. It's just it's less it's geeky. so much easier to kind of do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, like yeah. we do get requests. The rods are amazingly versatile tools, right? And we get requests from people to put a grain weight window on a fly rod, right? So it's like, oh, this rod can work with a fly line all the way down to a hundred and 20 grains as a three weight to a, you know, 175 grains out of seven weight or whatever. And it's, um, you know, that's it, it, the, the fly lines are designed to hit those things. It's much easier to go a four with a four and a seven with a seven. Um, because there are people out there casting those and make sure the rod, they work on the correct rods and, and Orvis does take a, spe a special pride to make sure that we don't, go wild with some of our grain weights um and our rod windows as well so i don't know if that if that helps but i think it's in i think it's yeah, in, it depends on the caster what you're doing with them I mean, you right. you could you could theoretically cast a one weight on a 12 weight rod you sure you could cast it it wouldn't be fun but um it'd be a lot of work but you could do it well, I mean, when I, back in my guiding era, um, I used to occasionally, if I had a brand new beginner, I might grab a six weight line to put on a five weight just to help that person start to feel the load of the fly line. The first time they were these, you know, never, ever gone out, going to go out and give it a try. They really need to help kind of learning that feel. And that was one way to do it, but you don't want it to become a crutch, you know, as well, but it helps a lot. I used to do that just to help um beginners get started um so it's you know but you really can like you said you could cast a you know a, it's fun every once in a while to throw a heavier weight line on one of your favorite rods just to see what it can do um but you know we we, we take special care and making sure they match up right as asking so a, a hydro saltwater line is one weight heavy it's not one weight heavy is it it's a new hydro saltwater line I do not believe it's a full size heavy. No, it should be a half size. Uh, let's see. I do not. Michael says I do not like textured line for still water fishing. I find the texture rips off the water when you try to lift line off the water. Does the textured line have more water tension for still water in ponds? Um. I don't think so. No, I think you might be able to notice it maybe more um, as opposed to the other comparison would be the ocean, right? Um, or a quiet bay. Um, but I haven't noticed it. It it shouldn't. I mean, I understand what you're saying, moving water versus um, or in that. It, it really shouldn't have any kind of different of the way that it lays on the water. Um, but I think that's a that's an interesting perspective, though, because I, I would I could see how that um uh, for still water fishing would, would, um, you know, make a little bit more noise. It looks like Tim Johnson, um, looks like Tim Johnson weighed a business card. He said it's 20 grains equals 1.29 grams. wonder why Tim Johnson's got one of those little scales. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so there you go. Where did that, you look that, that up, Tim? That is the difference. <laughs> that is so is that the difference? Is that the, the difference? 
Really? Yeah, a little bit more. Oh. As once huh. on the lower grains, on the lower weight rods, yeah. So that's a really it, good analogy for someone to understand. Yeah. So those thousandths of an inch really do make a difference. They do. Interesting. And I mean, the the grain weight thing, we're not to, we don't need to go into it, but it's like really the grain weight thing to think about is like 30 feet was like that used to be how long fly line heads were. But they're not 30 feet anymore. They're 40 feet or 45 feet or 50 feet in some situations. So some of those measurements to some extent are a little antiquated, but they're still a set kind of standard that's important that we have or else fly lines and rods from different companies would it's the same importance of having a real seat standard that everybody's reel fits into everybody's rod or at least in most cases it does um because that allows equipment to be used across brands aaron wants to know what's the best starter rod and reel um well, aaron yeah, well, one you can afford, but Aaron, I would say that um, you can't go wrong with the clear water outfits. Uh, you yeah. didn't say whether it was trout or salt water or whatever, but the clear water are a very economical package, um, and they are amazing rods. We we yeah. fish them we fish them ourselves, even though we can we can fish anything we want. We you know we fish the clear, clear water. water rod is fantastic. It's it's a yeah. great fly rod. It really is. It's almost too good for the money. Charles says, I catch juvenile tarpon on three-weight glass all the time, but I need Whoa. to replace my five-weight. Thanks for answering my question. Charles, when quarantine's over, Tom and I are coming down. Yeah, yeah. When comparing the scientific angler's amplitude and Orvis Pro lines, what are the main differences? Because although um, we own scientific anglers and they make their line, we, they make our lines, There, there is a difference. Absolutely. I love this question because there is a – kind of a, a, a misnomer or a misunderstanding that um, that Orvis lines are just SA lines in a different box. Um, we control all elements of the design, um, uh, all the specs of the, the fly rods. We work hand in hand with scientific anglers to manufacture our fly lines. So the amplitude, um, basically think about these are similar, you know, batters um, that pump out different shaped brownies and cookies or I mean, it's trying to think of a, you know, analogy that's similar. Um, we both use ASD Plus, which is a revolutionary additive that came out um, uh, through design with scientific anglers. Um, it is an additive that goes into the material and creates slickness that actually migrates through the capillaries of the of the fly line, so it's constantly regenerating, which is just amazing. It's a it's a really really noticeably um, uh, uh, amazing slickness additive. Um, as I said, we control all the design of the taper. So all those things, the front tapers, the tweaks, the designs, the color changes, where those color changes are, that's all controlled by Orvis and scientific anglers um, will do the manufacturing of it. So Amplitude Trout and Pro Trout, um, they may have AST Plus in them, but overall the performance of the actual fly line and the tapers are completely different. So they're going to do different things. You put them on the same fly rod, they're going to behave slightly different. Um, so yeah, does that answer it? Yeah. Um, Sean has a question. This is a toughie. Other than buying a bunch of lines, which is very expensive, um, how can I cast a bunch and see which one I like? And of course, doing this from home, the fly shops are closed right now. That is a great question. My suggestion, my suggestion, Sean, would be to, to read over the description and based on what Jesse has said here today, um, get a line from Orvis, if you don't like it, we'll replace it with another line. Sure. And credit, and credit you, or you can return it. Um, yeah, unfortunately you can't. Um, hopefully fly shops are gonna be opening soon, but if you need one right now, I would just go with go with your gut, which, which line you think is gonna be best for you. And if it doesn't perform the way you want, then, then return it. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100%. And shout out to um, our fly shops as well. You know, obviously, you can't go into a fly shop, or there are some places where you can actually. Um, but, uh, you know, those people are going to be able to um, also help you a lot because they may know the fisheries that you're fishing and make a really strong recommendation for you, um, as well as have the ability um, in hopefully weeks, months months, whatever it is to, for you to be able to cast a wide variety, bring your rod in, you know, uh, and be able to try out all of that stuff. But if you can't, Orvis will always stand behind you with, um, 
the satisfaction guarantee. Um, so if you find a raw, if you find one or, or reach out to our outfitter department on chat or by phone and they can talk you through, um, the things that they might recommend and, uh, hopefully we get the right one for you. Chase wants to know, what do I look for when buying a used Henry's fork, eight and a half foot, five weight Orvis graphite rod cracks, et cetera. Uh, Chase, you know, um, as long as the rod hasn't been, um, nicked or, or whacked on something, I would look for, yeah, cracks or or places where it might have had an impact. Um, but um, graphite doesn't break down with age, really. It would take a long time for that that rod to to break down. It was a great rod, that old Henry's fork. Um, you know, I would just I would just look for any signs of of nicks or abrasions or anything on it if if you can get a look at it. Flex yeah, take a look at the cork too and the connection on the real seat. Just make sure all that stuff looks, you know, in decent shape. Doesn't need to be great, but if the cork yeah, but that's fixable. That's yeah, fixable. Yeah, you're right. taking a lot of that stuff off. But you're I mean, you're right. It's you can't always tell if someone's hit the rod tip with a thing, a split shot, you know, unfortunately. But uh looking at the guides, I think, and and all that up the tip, looking for impact. I think that's a yeah. Oh, Tim did actually, he said before that he didn't weigh a business card, but he just did. And it's 23 grains. So that's still a difference between a five and a six, right? Yes. And then some. Thank, thank you, Tim. Tim, you're the best. Are you taking time out from, from doing rods to uh, yeah. waste your time listening to us, Tim? <laughs> Jimmy says, is there anything we can do to help fly shops right now? Are Orvis endorsed guides still booking trips for mid late summer? Um, yes, a lot of Jimmy, a lot of the Orvis endorsed guides are, are booking trips. And the best thing you can do for the for the guides is to uh, you know place a deposit for a trip and you know maybe keep it open-ended, but um, the cash flow is important to to fly shops. Um, and um, and guides. So um, you know, place a deposit for a for a trip and and keep it open ended, or make it hopefully for late summer. And then for fly shops, um, some of them are doing curbside service, and um, and a lot of them are doing internet business. So if you can, you know, if you can, um, give them some business over the internet. If they don't have an internet site, then um, see if they have curbside service. That's an awesome question. Thanks for asking it because that's an important part of our community. Like we were saying, those are opportunities of places to learn and and uh, and finding ways to support your local fly shop through this challenge is, is important as well. Oh, no, it's a different Tim Johnson. I'm sorry, even better, a new Tim Johnson. Tim, well, we are so sorry. We wouldn't have given you grief if we had known it wasn't the Tim Johnson the <laughs> who does the who does the uh, does the artwork on Rod Grip. So, our apologies, Tim. I'm really sorry about that. I should yeah. have checked the picture. <laughs> oh boy. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> What's the best way to fix the welded loop? Scott wants to know. Um, Scott, if the welded loop fails. The best thing to do is is what I described for the sinking line. Fold the line over, put a couple, put a couple, or you can put a nail knot. If it's a floating line, you can put a nail knot on the end of the line, um, or you can fold it if you want to. If you want a self loop, you can fold it over and put a couple little nail knots over it, and that'll hold it. When is Orvis going to make zippered waders? I don't know if it's. If it's Kenley that keeps asking, but every time I do a Facebook Live, people ask about zippered waders. They're coming. Um, Jim Kershaw is working on them. It is not an easy to have good, to have really good zippered waders that don't cost a thousand dollars is a real product development challenge. Zippered waders are very expensive, and of course they in, in, introduce a lot of technical issues. So. Um, we're working on it. Don't have a date for you. I'm just smirking. That's all. Why? <laughs> no, because I, I'm a fan of uh, zippered waders as well. I think we all are. Yeah. <clears throat> do, line needs, do lines need to be stretched? 
asked Philip. I would say yes. If they've been on a reel for a while, yeah, you should stretch them. Yeah, and the I, I, absolutely. And it makes it that's really nice if you go out and kind of I I watched uh I watched someone do it on the tailgate of their truck one time. Or had a friend like walk out, you know, at the boat launch and just kind of like lean on it. And they actually cast for a little, especially at the beginning of a new season. And I like to do it with my sinking lines, um, all my still water lines. I definitely like that. I don't like to curl up. Feels like the connectivity is a little bit better. But yeah, I mean, if you, a lot of people stretch their lines when they buy them too. So, I mean, whether that's antiquated these days, but like they get a new line, they like stretch it a little bit. Um, yeah, I like stretch a line. Saltwater fishing, I'll, I'll stretch them too because again, you want a straight line connection usually, yeah. and, and almost always. Trout fishing, it's not as important because often you want slack, <laughs> you want curls in your line. But, um, how about good waders with boots attached? Yep, Jim Jim Kershaw is working on that too. It's another another technical challenge. Jesse's smirking again. I, I just I get to see what's actually being worked on, so it's like I'm that's yeah. me trying to like reinforce the. We're working on it without saying anything. Yeah. Jesse sits next to Jim Kershaw. So Jesse sees all the samples. I'm fortunate right. enough to sit next to Jim Kershaw. Yeah. 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 Uh, any upcoming Orvis collaborations to save up for? I really like the Orvis tacky boxes and the waterproof sling. Any collaborations coming up? I guess we can't talk about them if they're coming um, up. Yes, there are. I can think of a couple of them, but we are so, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, I'm just bound by, uh, um, bound by my contractual obligation to Orvis and I'll talk about them until they launch. <laughs> right. Fair enough. But thank you for uh, pointing out two things, two collabs that you like. That's always awesome to hear and reinforces the fact that um, it's really awesome for us to get an opportunity to work with other businesses. Um, in the fly fishing industry. Uh, I don't see any more questions. We've gone for an hour and 10 minutes, Jesse. I can't believe it. Where has the, it's because we haven't had any time together, Tom. It's like we just have so much fun. I know. I'm glad, I'm glad we did this today so I get to chat with you for a while. It was my pleasure. Uh, oh, Richard says, super fine line is perhaps a misnomer as it matches perfectly with my H3804F and the H3806F I was lent last year. Just a perfect dry fly combo. Well, thank you, Richard. Very nice of you to say so. I love that line, too. You know, and that's the, the funny thing about that line is you would think it would be like a super delicate taper, um, but it's actually a pretty forceful front taper on that. And that's for great, like, quick loading you know, laying out those nice small streams and things. It's a really, really nice line. And that's the thing is like a lot of fly lines don't necessarily like our power taper is good. Is a great carp line. Our saltwater tropic is a great trout, you know, is a great carp line. You know, there's definitely like they can cross. It's amazing what some of these lines will do in kind of opposite scenarios in some of the situations. Like I was saying, the saltwater tropic we've been loving for carp fishing because it's got that, that braided core. So um, it's it's like like we were saying earlier. It's fun to take those lines and try them on different rods to see what they do. Hey guys, you know we get we're getting some questions about what's coming up. What's coming up? We can't. We really we really can't tell you. We're not we're not allowed to um, talk about future future products. Um, um, I would just say we're working hard on it, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the stuff that we've come out with over the last couple of years and our development team, um, Sean, Natalie, Jim, uh, Simon, uh, are all trying to continue to just build the newest, coolest stuff. And uh, this hasn't stopped us. We are we are working pretty hard uh, through all this, it's just some, some of us from – a different bedroom or a different place, but uh, we haven't stopped the uh, the new product train at all. Yep. Where where in Manchester, Vermont, is a good river to check out? First timer here. Well, the Batten Kill is our is our premier river. That's mm -hmm. wild trout stream um, that has trout all the way from the very teeny tiny headwaters almost down to the Hudson River in New York State. 
Um, I've caught brown trout down almost to the Hudson in the bat and kill. Um, so that's, that's the river. And its tributaries are pretty good if you like really tiny streams. If Jesse takes the rest of the day off to go fishing, what rod reel combo does Jesse grab today? That's a good question. Uh, that is a good question. Um, I am having a, a little bit of a love affair with the new 10 foot two weight recon. Um, that has been the rod that I've been fishing the most. Um, given the early time of the year, I'm doing a lot of nymphing, some streamer fishing, but primarily nymphing. Um, and that's the rod that I've been typically using. Um, I also like the 10 four, um, F. That'd be the, if I didn't know what I was going to get into, the 10 4 F would be my versatile rod that I could do just basically absolutely anything that was thrown at me with. Um, but the brand new Orvis Recon 10 foot 2 weight. Michael wants to know what I would take out. I would, I would take one of two rods depending on where I was go exactly where I was going. And I might even take two. Um, I would take the, a uh, 10 foot three weight clear water tight line rod because I have one in my truck <laughs> and that's all I have, but I like the clear water. And then I take a 905 uh, H3 905 F uh, because this time of year I might be fishing anything from a, a small blue wing olive dry to a, to a big heavy streamer. Yeah. I so just want to point out that the real Tim Johnson has jumped on now as well. Yeah, I saw that. The real Tim, not the real Tim Johnson. The well, Tim Johnson we, the Tim Johnson the we know. Tim Johnson. I'm the one who we <laughs> the first time. So. We got to be careful of that we got no. two Tim Johnsons. Yeah, two Tim there. Johnsons, and they're both equally important. Charles says, "Have either of you fished the Asopus Creek in the Catskills? Any tips or tricks?" I have. I have uh, not given over it. Three wet flies, swing three wet flies. That's a traditional way to fish the Asopa. That's how I learned to fish it. And those little rainbows in there respond pretty well to that. Other than that, I don't know any tips, but it's a good place for swinging, swinging a team of wet flies. All right. We're all pretty solid Tim Johnsons around here, says Tim. Do you ever take, oh, here's one more question. Do you ever take an Orvis bamboo? Yes. I do. Um, I have a, uh, I have a, uh, is it the, the four weight, the Penn's Creek? I have a Penn's Creek bamboo that I love and I fish it most of the summer when I'm fishing small streams. Um, I love it. I fish it a lot. I fish it. Uh, I don't fish fiberglass much. Um, if I'm going to do that kind of fishing where I want a slower rod, um, I'm lucky enough to uh, have a bamboo rod that, that um, I got for an anniversary uh, from Orvis for an, one of my bigger anniversaries. And, um, I, I love it and use it a lot. All right. Jesse Haller, product developer extraordinaire. Thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon. It's my uh, pleasure to be on with the Tom Rosenbauer. Oh, uh, shut up. <laughs> great, great answers. Uh, great info. Your wealth, your wealth of knowledge. And um, I know that I speak for everyone that um, that you did a great job. And, and thank you for thank you for all your knowledge and all your great product development and your friendship. It's it's my pleasure on all of those, really. Um, and it's been uh, it's been uh, fun to be able to do these every once in a while. It's great to see your face, Tom. And thanks, everybody, for all the awesome questions. Hope to see you all out on the water soon. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.